Listen. Short story long. Welcome. It could take your whole life. Preach. Develop clarity. Second, patience. If it scares you, you should probably do it. Whatever you think you don't have, you have something else in its place. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here we are with a very special guest. I'm so excited um, for this podcast because I always say, like, I feel very lucky that this podcast has allowed me to sit and chat with a lot of people that I never otherwise would have been able to, and you are very much one of those people, meaning you know, I created this thing thinking like, oh, I'll tell cool stories and this will be a cool content piece and blah, blah, blah. And it's now kind of turned into this thing. And because of, you know, I have a lot of listeners that are very engaged and it's obviously, so now it's enticing for people to come on. Also, it's forced me every week to hunt down someone new. Um, and so it's led me to things like this. I have read three of your books uh, and was very blown away by them, but never thought that I'd have the chance to just sit and chat with you for an hour. So I am very excited. It must be working. <laughs> yeah, it must be, man. The tricks must be working. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, I, I made my own. I'll tell you in here once we kind of cover it so the listeners understand it. But I made my own contraption that was birthed off of some of the things, some of the work that you do. And I want to tell you about it towards the end and see, I want to get your feedback on it. If I'm sure. headed in the right direction cool. or not. But it, it involves a VR headset and some, uh, you know, dream images that I, like my vision board. Nice. Um, so, for all the listeners and for everyone, why don't you give us, you know, on this pod I usually tell people's stories um, and how they got to where they are. But like I said, you have so much valuable information that I want to make sure we have enough time for that. Sure. That being said, how do you become you? W what would you call what you do if you had to give yourself like a title mm. and then how do you like how'd you become this sure well you know for me i've always been just a curious person yep. you know and and i like to look for answers kind of discover the right answers and, and if i if i'm researching something or investigating something or as a kid just asking a question and then searching for the answer if i never got the answer. I never stopped searching. It was just kind of the way I was. And if I got answers from adults or authorities or teachers that I thought had the answers and the answers weren't to my satisfaction, yeah. whether it was even religious in nature, it just wasn't something that resonated with me. I would never stop the investigation. So I just had two really great parents that uh, just kind of fostered that and encouraged that. So I was always on this kind of journey. Yeah. And I always believe in human potential. It's just something that I always believed in. And, and um, you know, I think for some of us to, to wake up, we need a wake-up call. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in 1986, I got run over by a truck in a triathlon. I was in the bi bicycle portion of the race, and I was coming to this turn, and there were two cyclists on the, on the corner, and there was a cadet kind of waving me on, a police officer who was pointing at me. And I kind of looked up, and he was telling me to turn and, and turn right, and and to pass these guys. But the problem was he had his back to the oncoming traffic. So he's pointing at me to make the turn. Yeah. And so I make the turn and here comes a four wheel drive Bronco just clips me from behind, catapults me out of my bike. And um, I land on my back and, and, the, and the SUV was going about 55 miles an hour. And the woman was an 83 year old woman that just didn't have any reflexes. So my bike pops about 15 feet in the air. Yeah. And then I just grab the bumper and she just drags me down the road and then she stops and I just kind of roll about a uh, good 20 yards or so. And uh, <clears throat> you're laying on your back and you can feel the blood pooling in your back and you know it's just not a sprain strain, you know, something's really wrong. So, yeah. so anyway, I wound up breaking f uh, six vertebrae in my spine. Jeez. And when you have that kind of compressive force, the compression of gravity and the deceleration takes the columns of the vertebrae and compresses them like a pancake. So when you start compressing volume, matter has to go somewhere. So I had bone fragments on my spinal cord. And the very top segment, the eighth thoracic vertebrae, was broken like a pretzel. So I had multiple compression fractures. I had um, bone fragments on the cord, and I had the neural arch of the eighth thoracic vertebrae compressing up against the spinal cord. So the typical surgery 
for that is called the Harrington rod surgery. They just, in my case, they would cut off all the backs of my vertebrae from the base of my neck to the base of my spine yes. and screw in these stainless steel rods. And the act of screwing them in would kind of cantilever the spinal column off the spinal cord. Yep. Uh, but the prognosis was that I'd probably be uh, compromised in some way. And if I didn't have the surgery, uh, I was guaranteed to be paralyzed, you know, for the rest of my life. So anyway, so, you know, if, if it was anybody else and I saw the x-rays and I, you know, I looked yeah. at the, the scans and everything, I probably would have recommended the surgery, but this was me, you know, and yeah. I wasn't so quick to, um, to sign on the dotted line. So I had four opinions from four of the leading surgeons in Southern California, and they all said, herring to rod surgery is your only answer. And uh, so in 1986, it just wasn't common to... Uh, go against medical advice. Yeah, and, yeah. and so I, I decided to not have a surgery. And I just thought, well, there's an intelligence that lives within us that gives us life. And it's keeping our heart beating and digesting our food and organizing so many trillions of functions. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. I'm basically laying face down yeah. and uh, not moving a lot at all. And my life just came to a halt. And I said, well, since I'm not doing anything, well, let's see if I can make contact with it and give it some instructions, give it a plan, give it a template, give it a design. And any idea why, like, was there any previous reading or anything that you had done that gave you that much? Yeah, you know, I was kind of a weird guy. I mean, I studied a lot of yoga. Yeah. I mean, I did, before that, I did uh, three hours of yoga a day uh, for years. I, I had a martial arts studio. I I, I was very into um, the subconscious mind. I had a hypnotherapy practice at the time. So I, I knew the power of the mind, but I, I didn't know that it could work to this extent. You know, yeah. I mean... So I wanted to see if I could take it to the next level. And I thought, well, when you're weighing what you know against what you don't know, um, there's risk involved. But if, um, if you have a plan, you might actually wind up somewhere. So, so I took everything that I knew, and, um, and I just kind of trusted myself. I just kind of went for it. Anyway, I decided that I was going to, when I was going to clear on that image of what I wanted, I would surrender it. To this spine because I couldn't heal it, you know, Joe Dispenza, but this intelligence, if it got the proper instructions, could. So six and a half weeks of utter d dismay, dark night of the soul, couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. I was all over the board. I was frustrated, angry, and uh, things got worse. And then uh, I wouldn't quit, though, you know, so it would take me hours to reconstruct my spine. And whenever I lost my focus... And I started thinking about living in a wheelchair. Should I sell my home? Should I sell my practice? I, I'd stop and start all over again because mm. that wasn't the image. You know, like when you're facing crisis, we tend to focus on what we don't want to have happen yeah. instead of what we do want to have happen. So, so when what, you say you were reconstructing your spine, like what, what were you doing? I was like, I was a little guy yeah. with a, like a trowel, like a, well, that would like was a, a mason. Yeah. And I was kind of just running this trowel up this, up my vertebrae, yeah. you know, and just reconstructing it. And I can draw uh, you know, T8, T9, T10, T11, T12. No, I can draw it upside down left-handed. I know those yeah. vertebrae sideways, you know. Yeah. So, so the problem was is that I just couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted to do, and so it would take me hours to get through it. And then six and a half weeks, it was just like I hit a tennis ball in the sweet spot. I hit a golf ball just right. Something clicked, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, what took me three, four hours to do, I was doing 45 minutes. I was firing and wiring circuits in my brain. I was practicing being present and paying attention. And it's a skill. The more you practice it, I think the better you get at it. So then I started noticing significant changes in my body. I mean, big changes. My pain levels went away. I got a lot of motor function, sensory function back. I started feeling really good. Yeah. And, uh, and then I started correlating what I was doing inside of me w with what was happening in my body and outside of me. And then I was like a dog on a bone, and I just knew. I just started looking forward to doing it, and it yeah. just got better and easy. Anyway, ten and a half weeks, I was uh, back on my feet and uh, back running you know, my, my clinic at 12 weeks. And um, I just made a deal with myself that uh, if I ever was able to stand up again, I'd spend the rest of my life studying the mind-body connection, mind over matter. So what I do is... I hopefully provide the proper information for people uh, to transcend some limitation or some obstacle in their body or in their life. Yeah. Sheesh. 
And then would, when you, through, as you were going through the process of reconstructing, did you have anyone, like were you getting updated scans or anything like that that told you you were even making progress? Mm. Or was this all just like with the faith that you'd figure it out one day? Yeah, you know, um, I had a goal because they told me that if I decided against the surgery, and of course they thought I hit my head, that I had a head injury, yeah. or no, no one would do this, or I had PTSD, that that um, my goal was uh, uh, three months. They didn't want to see anything because, you know, bones usually take about you know, two to three months to heal. And yeah. these bones are called medullary burns, they're spo spongy bones. Uh, so medullary bones just are more vascular in nature. So it wasn't anything to do uh, for the first three months. Yeah. So for me, it was just a constant overcoming of myself every yeah. day. And then, you know, I just knew that the day that I was supposed to walk, I just got up. I knew what the, I just knew it was uh, time to walk. And, and they wanted to put me in this body cast for like uh, six months and, and, uh, they fitted me for it. They molded it to my body. And I put it on once, and I was just like, "There's no way I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna live like this." And just, uh, and, and I never have pain in my back. I never really have any any limitations. So, and, and then I got interested in spontaneous remissions. Like, <clears throat> does anybody else yeah. experience what I experienced? And so then I started asking questions like, "How did this all happen? Genes make proteins. Proteins." create structure and function, and the expression of proteins is the expression of life. Did I change genes? I mean, so I started looking into the mind-body connection, started researching, you know, conventional texts, and I'm a decent background in, in science, and I couldn't find the answers anywhere in the conventional textbooks. And then you start looking at epigenetics, neuroplasticity, the yeah. quantum model of reality, and all of a sudden, I started realizing that there's a whole nother realm of science when you're, when you're no longer looking at normal. Yeah. And uh, so I started studying spontaneous remissions and interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world to see what they were doing or what they did, uh, either treating conventionally or unconventionally. Most of them were staying the same or getting worse, and all of a sudden they got better. Yeah. And what, what happened there? So after, and did you find a consistency? Oh, my God. Yeah, absolutely. There and were... Four very common things. That, Can you tell me? Yeah, first thing is that most people believe that there was an intelligence that lived within them, not outside yeah. of them, that that was a resource if they could connect to it, just like I did, and begin to allow it to help them heal, uh, it would be important. So so uh, there's nothing mystical about this intelligence, and you know, you can, some people had a religious take on it, some people just a spiritual take, some people were just pragmatists that they just trusted, you know, the whole way. The second thing was that on some level they thought that they had contributed or they were responsible for their own health condition, yeah. that the, the 10 years of living in stress, and living in stress is living in survival, and stress, as you know, knocks the brain and body out of balance. And so, and it's a scientific fact that the long-term effects of the hormones of stress downregulate genes and create disease. So yeah. people spend 70% of their life living in survival, living in stress, and no organism can live in emergency mode for that amount of time. And yeah. certain emotions that we feel when we react to people or conditions in our lives, that emergency state, the arousal of the brain and body drives us to very primitive behaviors yeah. and primitive yeah. thoughts. And, and they became, became aware that they had to stop being that person. That's a very important thing. They had to break the habit of being themselves. Yeah. And that's significant because they're not relying on now any drug, even yeah. though they're treating uh, with a drug or a treatment or, or surgery, that they're all of a sudden taking more responsibility of paying attention to how they think, yeah. noticing how they act or how they speak, or looking at how they feel and stop blaming somebody from 20 years ago yeah. that they just decided that they had to make the changes. So they had to break the habit of being themselves. Third thing I thought was so fascinating was that they had to reinvent themselves. Yeah. And they started thinking, well, God, if I had a chance, another chance, another shot at life, who would I be? And there's this concept in neuroscience called mental rehearsal. And when you close your eyes and you plan an action or you rehearse mentally what you're about to do, yep. if you're truly present, the brain doesn't know the difference between what's going on out there and what's going on in here, that the imagery that you're creating, the brain captures as an experience. Yep. So then the experience begins to enrich the brain. So they, over time, 
began to install the neurological hardware in their brain, the platform of who they would become. And as they started doing that and they started overcoming fear or anger, or hostility or uh, pain or suffering, they started getting happy. Yeah. And they started feeling these heartfelt emotions of freedom and gratitude for no reason. Yeah. And th I think that when they started feeling that feeling independent of what was going on in their life, in other words, they weren't waiting for their healing to happen so they could feel grateful. Yeah, they yeah. were feeling grateful before the healing, which is gratitude is the ultimate state of receiving. I mean, when you receive something, or you've just received something, or yeah. something's happening to you, or something's happened to you, you feel gratitude, you say thank you. Yeah. Well, the body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between an experience that creates an emotion yeah. and an emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone. So the body starts to feel gratitude. It's believing it's in the actual experience of being healed. So, yeah. and, and the research shows, Chris, that the environment signals the gene. And the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion. Yeah. So then you can signal genes ahead of the environment if you begin to embrace emotions before the experience. Yeah. And genes begin to make proteins and proteins give you the, the expression of life. So yeah. that so fact alone, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. That fact alone, I think is like so mind blowing in the sense, not to sound like, I'm sure you hear this a lot, but like it just makes me feel like instead of everyone living in reaction to what happens, you we have the ability to create, to, to be creators of our own lives. And I know that this, like I said, it sounds like a lot of things that you hear a lot of places, but to really wrap your head around, you have the ability to be on offense instead of defense. Yeah. Feels like, I don't know, it literally feels like a superpower. It feels like learning that you have these capabilities way beyond what we think that we do. And I know from reading your books and from all the information that I've seen that there's actually proof that it's working. Like this isn't some like mysterious hippie stuff. No. And I just, I don't know, man, I, I have a real hard time with it because it literally feels like we just learned about like exercise for the first time or sure. something, you know? Well, this is, this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. Yeah. And, and so when people start scratching their head and saying, you mean, my genes don't create disease and you can save them. Less than 1% of the people on the planet are born with a genetic condition. The other 99 to 95% are lifestyle behaviors, choices. But why are we always told that? Well, if you want to have people become reliant on something outside of them to take away what's going on inside of them, you'll advertise, yeah. <laughs> you know, you'll market. Yeah. You, but people will say, I need this, can, I need this drug. I need something outside of me to change my internal states. That's profits, that's money. So it's a crazy thing when people start, I mean, evidence is the loudest voice. We have studies to show that you can change your gene expression in four days. Genes that suppress cancer yeah. growth and tumors. Genes to grow new neurons in the brain, not just new connections, but new neurons. Yeah. Genes for oxidative balance. And that's at almost any age? At any age. We yeah. randomly selected just, you know, a group of people and we, we had them think differently make different choices, do different things, create new experiences and feel new emotions. Four days, they regulated eight genes in common that, that literally would change their health. So, so then finish kind of what you were saying about like, explain to me, so we all know the narrative, it's just embedded in us of you're born with genetics that are gonna cause disease and blah, 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 and these things just happen and it's out of your control. Explain to me the, how it really works in okay. the sense of, a little bit of, I don't know if I'm asking you to do too much in one thing, but like uh, epigenetics and you talk about junk DNA mm -hmm. and how that whole system really works. Sure. Okay, well, um, your body is a protein producing machine. Okay. And every cell in your body makes proteins except for red blood cells. And in order for a cell to make a protein, a gene has to be regulated. Yeah. So then genes are like Christmas tree lights. Yeah. They're switching on and off all the time. And when they switch on, they upregulate and they make a healthy protein. Yeah. When they switch off, they downregulate and they make a cheaper protein. Yeah. So then if you're thinking the same way, making the same choices, doing the exact same things in routine and the same habits, 
doing the same things that create the same experiences, that create the same feelings, you got the same genes turned on and the other genes turned off. Yeah. Same Christmas tree lights on, the other one's off. Now you're headed for a genetic destiny. Which also ties into the fact that we sort of, we see the world the way we want to see it. Like we have kind of our beliefs and we validate that with everything around us, not vice versa. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah. We don't see things how they are. We see things how we are. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to... Okay. Yeah. So, so now we're just running that loop right. all day, every day. And if you don't know that you have control over your genes, then it never crosses your mind, right? Yeah. So then, So then the other part of that is when a person's living by the same feeling and the same emotion every single day, and those emotions are influencing the way they think and the way they act... Yeah. And they can't think greater than how they feel or they can't act greater than how they feel and feelings and emotions are a record of the past. Yeah. They're in a program of the past, right? So the body again now is believing it's in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week and now you're down-regulating a gene. So then if you have a propensity for Alzheimer's, if you have propensity for heart disease, if your family has a propensity for cancer yeah. or ulcerative colitis or MS or whatever, then of course it makes sense then that if you're living in the reactions of fear and anger and hostility and envy and jealousy and re resentment and, and pain and suffering, it's those very emotions that select and instruct genes. Yeah. So then think about this. Two identical twins, both born with the same exact genome. There's no variations. They have the same exact genes. Yeah. One dies at 52, the other one dies at 88. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's got to be some environmental influence, yeah. right? Yeah. So then they used to say genes create disease. 1% of the population you know, uh, has a genetic condition like Tay-Sachs disease or sickle cell anemia or type 1 diabetes. Yeah. The other 99%, 95% is lifestyle. So then they say, well, it's not genes that create disease. It's the environment that signals the gene that creates disease. Okay, but how can two factory workers working side by side, both exposed to the same carcinogenic chemical, yeah. one gets cancer and the other doesn't? Yeah. Well, the environment around the cell is still the inner environment of your body. Yeah. So then a person who's living, reacting to the same people in the same way, same circumstances in the same way, they keep knocking on the same genetic door. Yeah. And so sooner or later, once that gene is signaled, now all of a sudden, the, the cell is programmed to begin to make a cheaper protein. So the question is, can you reverse that process? Well, if it took you five years to create the health condition, you may have to work a little bit to reverse it. Yeah. But yet, we're getting so good at measuring and, and being able to teach people how to do this that it's not uncommon that we see people have a complete remission of a health condition in one week in a week-long workshop that we have. Yeah. Because they understand then they're going to be the governor or the, or the, or the ruler of their own thoughts and feelings and, and they'll go through a period where they feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, that's because you're in the midst of change. And, yeah. But they're willing to do it as long as they understand that if they keep changing the way they think, act, and feel, yeah. there should be biological changes that take place in the body and that's exactly what we see. Gosh. And, and so thoughts and feelings are kind of the core of all this. Yeah. It's being able to manage and get those straight. Okay. Well, think about this. Yeah. You wake up in the morning, most people, your, your brain is a record of the past. Yep. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced this moment. It's the memory bank of everything you know. It's the known self. Yep. People wake up in the morning, they start thinking about their problems. 90% of the people do this. Those yeah. problems are memories that are etched in their brain. Yeah. They're connected to certain people and certain objects and things at certain times and places. Yeah. If they believe their thoughts have something to do with their future, the moment they're remembering their past, they're thinking in the past. Yeah. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with them. Yeah. So then all of a sudden they start feeling unhappy. Well, thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain, feelings are the vocabulary of your body. Yeah. How you think and how you feel creates a state of being. Yeah. So most people start their day with their entire state of being in the familiar past. Now, when they're familiar past, they're going to crave the predictable future because they want to stay in the known. Yeah. The unknown, whew, that's just, they'd rather hang on to their suffering yeah. and their pain than take a chance in possibility. In fact, they don't even know they're suffering. They just think it's how they normally feel yeah. until they decide to begin to change. So when we're studying spontaneous remissions, people kind of stumbled on this. By, not, by, by trusting something innate in them, something intuitive in them. Yeah. Not so mechanical, but just like, God, if I had another shot at life, yeah. how would I think? How would I act? How would I feel? Who would I become? Who will I be? Yeah. 
And they began to change by thought alone. The last thing they had in common, which was really incredible, is that when they closed their eyes and began to image who they wanted to be when they opened their eyes, they lost track of time and space. Yep. They, when they opened their eyes, they thought it was 20 minutes later, it was an hour later. Yeah. Because the frontal lobe, that's the creative center of the brain, began to lower the volume to the circuits in the brain yeah. where you process space and time. Now your inner world becomes more real than your outer world. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you're laying strong footprints biologically in the brain and body. So when I saw what these commonalities were, the next thing I said was, well, hell, if it worked on sick people, could it work on well people? Can yeah. we help people to change that way? And if it worked on sick people, it should work again on sick people. So that kind of started the whole process. And then when it started working, then we started doing all these measurements to kind of demystify the process. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody's excluded from this. Nobody's excluded. Yeah. It's also real quick, when you talk about living in the past, one thing that I think you made very clear is the way that, you know, we've all seen or met or know very closely or maybe ourselves, uh, people that have had traumatic experiences and you see people living with the weight of that. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that's always blown my mind is if somebody had a traumatic injury to their knee and they walked with a limp for the rest of their life, we wouldn't think that's weird. But if you had a traumatic experience and you live in that for the rest of your life, well, that's now out of our control. Mm -hmm. That's some whole other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way you really clarified it in one of the books about how you can see that when this moment happens, it is embedded in a person and they are constantly now stuck and living in this traumatic sure. experience. Sure. Well, think about it. Tra trauma is the stronger the emotional reaction you have to whatever's causing it. Yeah. The more altered you feel inside of you, the more you pay attention to what's causing it. And the brain holds the image and freezes it and takes a picture. Yeah. And now you emboss that neurologically in the brain. Yeah. Now people will think neurologically within those circuits yeah. and feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so then you'll ask them, why are you this way? And they'll say, I'm this way because of this event, which means I haven't been able to change since that event, even though it's 20 years ago. Yeah. And so every time they tell the story of that event, they're refiring and rewiring and producing more of the emotions to reaffirm the fact that they are who they are, yeah. excusing themselves from changing. Now, here's the crazy part. The latest research on memory says that 50% of what we talk about in our past isn't even the truth. Yeah. So people are reliving a miserable life they never even had. Yep. They embellish it just so they could reaffirm the emotions that they feel so yeah. that it, it, it keeps them as the same person. Yeah. Gosh. Um, and, and then so, so then what you went on to say is like, I guess what I'm fascinated by is you didn't have like neurological training before your accident, right? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I studied biochemistry in undergraduate school, then I yeah. went to chiropractic college, and in chiropractic college, you have a lot of neuroscience because you're treating the nervous system through the spine. Got so it. I had Got a it. lot of experience in, in central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, autonomic nervous system. I knew, a, I knew, a, I know a lot about it, knew a lot about it. Uh, but this wasn't just that. This was like, okay, let's see if we can take this body's innate capacity to heal yeah. to the next level. Now, fast forward to today. Mm -hmm. We have blind people seeing. We have deaf people hearing. We have tumors that are on people's thyroids or in their brain, 50 brain tumors, one guy. There's no evidence of the disease in these people yeah. because they're not that person any longer. Yeah. The disease exists in somebody else. Yeah. They became a different persona. So, so then evidence becoming the loudest voice, we have the scientific evidence that you can strengthen your immune system, you can signal new genes, you can change your genetic future, you can create more brain and heart coherence. You know, We have all the scientific data to show what's possible, change your neurotransmitters, all that. And we also have evidence and testimony like, oh my God, yeah. somebody standing on a stage with stage four cancer, yeah. who weeks before was given the death sentence, yeah. that has no evidence of cancer. Now, if you're in the audience of a thousand people and you're listening to someone tell that story, and you, she doesn't look like a movie star, or doesn't look like a, a famous Paid person. Spokesperson. She just looks like a normal person. You're yeah. gonna start scratching your head and start saying, if she can do it, I can do it too. And yeah. numerous people in the audience are like, I'm in. Now, 
you help me. Now I can do it. And it's not anything that she's telling them to do. Yeah. The, the story, allegory, is, is the greatest way people begin to learn. So yeah. evidence becomes the loudest voice because yeah. all of a sudden, if you can do it, then I can do it. And so you're not doing it to, to outshine somebody. You're, do, you're up there to say, I did this and so can you. Now, now people are starting to take their power back and say, whether they're treating or not, yeah. I'm going to try this out. And that's just your body. Never mind the, the incredible opportunities you can create in your life when you change how you think and feel. Yeah. Yeah, that's just what's so fascinating to me is that you, it's not like, like you literally, so you had all the foundation, you had all this knowledge, but then you had this accent and you went and like learned and figured out all of this stuff and built, and now you do events and now you, I mean, it must feel, maybe you don't look at it this way because I'm just me who's never had this type of experience with another person. It must feel insane to be at these events time and time again where people are having these experiences. I mean- oh. Well, well, I'm telling you, I'm waking up in my dream. I, 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 Chris, I can tell you uh, that I never thought in my lifetime yeah. that I would be witnessing what I'm witnessing right now. I mean, I'm more surprised a lot of times than anybody because it's, it's way bigger than me now. It's just way bigger. And, yeah. um, and so does it bring me great joy? I, I don't know if there's a greater feeling for me and then witnessing human transformation. There's yeah. no greater feeling than being a part of somebody's transformation. It's, it's innate in us yeah. that somehow we should be taking care of one another like this and that we should be more unlimited in, in, in different ways. So yeah, it's a crazy time and, and uh, I, 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 I'm very thankful. Yeah, yeah, I just can't imagine that, that feeling of taking your own experience and getting it on this level that it's now on. What do you think like, okay, because what I'm also, you can get it if you read the books, but what I'm trying to explain to the listener is, I understand if you've never heard any of this stuff, you might be listening to this, you might be like, gosh, this is, just sounds too, mm -hmm. too good to be true, too whatever. What do you think is the reason why this type of knowledge and this type of work is so outside of normal, quote unquote? Is it because of the drug industry and because of the way that that all works? Well, if you asked me that two years ago, I would have said yes. Okay. Now, I'm not so sure because uh, I was in, in Sydney uh, a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and I'm signing books at the end of this event for my publisher, and I can't believe how many people are coming up saying, my oncologist told me to come uh, to this event. Not once, not twice, not three times, and numerous times yeah. because... Uh, Again, this is not just some whales in space thing. This is evidence-based. Yeah. And, and so evidence becomes the loudest voice because if your cousin's best friend yeah. healed from uh, Graves' disease or Hashimoto's syndrome or a brain injury or whatever, yeah. um, you're going to want to know like what, what, what happened. Absolutely. So, so 15 years ago, I had to work really hard they get people to just nod their head and just go, yeah, now information is the door because yeah. of technology, because of podcasts like this. People are exposed to information. You don't need a doctor to get this information. You yeah. don't need a, a priest or an authority. You can, yeah. a teacher, you can access information. And with information comes awareness. Yeah. So awareness is consciousness. And so you're less unconscious when you gain information. So then the next practical question is, and I'm a pragmatist, yeah. what are you gonna do with it? So when you take that philosophical, theoretical information, you apply it, you personalize it, you demonstrate it. Yeah. If you can get your behaviors to match your intentions, yeah. you can get your actions equal to your thoughts, your mind and body working together, you're gonna have a new experience. Yeah. Experience then enriches circuitry in the brain, learning creates circuitry, but experience enriches it. Yeah. The end product of an experience is an emotion. Yeah. Now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. Now, all of a sudden now, you're embodying the truth of that philosophy. Yeah. No one can take that away from you. And so then if you've done it once, you should be able to do it again. Yeah. And so then our research shows that when you start practicing this and you can create brain coherence, and we have so many great scans of people of all ages, of all colors, of all sizes, all shapes, all diets, doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. And they know how to create heart coherence. Wow. When they when they're able, when they're able to open their heart again, and feel an elevated emotion, they're going to start liking that a lot more than resentment or anger. Yeah. 
So then crossing that river, though, from the old self to the new self is where, where, where greatness is born. Yeah. This is where you're out of the bleachers and you're on the field. And that place of uncertainty, that place of unknown, is the perfect place to create in. So our research shows then that if you're able to just practice, just practice, you'll get better at it over time. And now more and more people are doing it so quickly. We have universities looking at our data saying, we don't know what you're doing there, but people can change their brain states in like four seconds. Yeah. That's unheard of. Five seconds. How do they? Well, they just know how to do it. Why? Because we've done it enough times with them. So now they know how to get beyond themselves. Yep. And if you're going to create anything new, you got to get beyond you in order to do that. Because if you're creating from your old self, yeah. nothing's going to change, right? Yeah. So, so we're teaching people that, that formula and demystifying the process and showing that we have the science to actually back it then more and more people begin to trust in the process more. Yep. Throw in a great miracle or two here and there <laughs> yeah. and a week-long a event, on top. and then that's it. Yeah. And then, then it just starts, it starts happening yeah. like magic. And then I can't tell you how many uh, emails or texts my, my staff send me of someone who said, yeah, he had leukemia. For, we just got one the other day, Le leukemia for... 10 years, 25-year-old kid, no leukemia, doctors can't believe it, they want to study him, what what took place. Uh, so so now... I mean, I can't imagine that being in my inbox on a Monday morning. Oh my God, I mean, like, <laughs> I look forward, look, if I if I wasn't seeing that type of yeah. evidence, I wouldn't do this. Yeah. Because because why would I want to do it? Of course. Unless, unless there was evidence. So so now, I mean, it's, it's just every day there's one that's yeah. just another fabulous, incredible story that, uh, that uh, there's a movement, yep. you know, there's yep. momentum now. Big time. Yeah, and it's, and it's a healthy movement. So crazy. Um, I'm going to ask a really lazy question that I was trying to think of a better way to ask it, but I'm just going to ask it. If you, like, can you give me a couple of the things that you are able to see and study that sort of prove people getting into this elevated state or feeling true gratitude, not just, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I felt super good. Yeah. Like, what do you measure? What's yeah. really like hitting this sort of undeniable, like, okay, something is happening yeah. here. I love the question because it means you're thinking about practicality, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's just start with the brain, okay? Yep. 100 billion neurons, roughly, right? And you got different like clusters of neurons, community of neurons yeah. that are assigned to like feeling your tip of your index finger. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 you becoming aware of your local in space and time. There's just different compartments that do different things, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have different circuits in your brain that are connected to every person in your life, mm -hmm. every object that you can recognize, yeah. every place you've been. If it's known, you have circuitry in your brain to reflect your environment, right? Yeah. So then when people are living in stress, uh, and stress, again, is when the brain and body are knocked out of balance, the arousal of those chemicals causes us to try to control yep. and predict everything in our life. So yep. we begin to shift our attention from one person to another person to another problem to another thing to another object to another meeting to another place. And as you start to activate these circuits in your brain that are associated with all of those elements... The arousal of the stress hormones causes these different compartments to fire like a lightning storm in the clouds. Yeah. The brain is firing very incoherently. And when the brain is incoherent, we're incoherent. Yeah. And when the brain isn't working right, we're not working right. And people get stuck in these aroused states. And that we spend a lot of time there, right? A Especially lot with like social media. And and shifting your attention that quickly, okay. you, you, you become what you practice. Yeah, okay. you, will be, you will have a shortened attention span. Why? Yeah. Because that's what you're practicing. Yeah. So that, that imbalanced brain is looking for immediate gratification or something to take away a feeling, yeah. right? A disturbance. So then when you're living in stress, uh, the primitive nervous system of the fight or flight nervous system, when you start feeling a danger or a threat, causes you to narrow your focus on the cause, right? Yeah. If, there's a, if there's a predator around the corner or something moving in the bushes, you freeze, your heart starts to race, your adrenaline starts to pick up, your respiratory rate changes, blood is sent to the extremities, you're gonna run, fight, or hide. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And you're in survival. Well, people spend 70% of their life living in that aroused state and their brain waves are way too fast. Yeah. And so 
They're focusing on everything material. Our research shows if you can break that habit of narrowing your focus on everything material and using your senses, because stress heightens the senses that cause us to become materialists, yeah. then we begin to experience separation, like you're there and I'm here. Uh -huh. But in the quantum world, there's nothing that's separate. Everything's connected. Yeah. It's our senses that fool us into this illusion. So our research shows that when you teach a person to go from a narrow focus on matter or on an object or a thing and broaden their focus and open their focus, to go from a convergent focus to a divergent focus, yeah. the act of sensing nothing but space, of nothing, begins to cause those different compartments of the brain that were once subdivided to begin to synchronize. Yeah. More communities begin to resonate at the same frequency. And what sinks in the brain links in the brain. Yep. And all of a sudden, the person starts feeling more whole. They start feeling more like themselves. Keep doing that. Now you have a significant amount of brain changes in those 100 billion neurons. Yep. They're all clapping at the same time. And if you have an audience of 10,000 people or a stadium of 50,000 people and everybody's clapping at the same time, yep. that type of coherence, that type of cadence, that type of rhythm creates energy. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the energy starts going up in the brain now. That's like taking the dimmer switch and going, let's turn it up. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're more aware. All of a sudden, you're more conscious. All of a sudden, you're more clear. You're more poised. You're more spontaneous. You're more clear. Because when the brain is coherent and it's working right, you're working right. And you got new ideas. Yeah. Now, if you're in the staff meeting and the person that you despise is talking the entire time and you're sitting there and you're thinking in your mind, how many ways you would like to choke this person, yeah. but you can't choke them, you can't fight, you can't leave the meeting, yep. or you can't hide under the table. You got those stress hormones pumping in your body and your heart is racing yeah. because it wants to run, it wants to fight, it wants to hide. You're, you're actually producing the chemistry to do one of those three things, but you're stepping on the gas and you're stepping on the brake. Yeah. And now the heart starts beating incoherently. And energy leaves the heart. Why? Because when you have two waves that are incoherent and they begin to interfere with one another, they're going to flatten out. Yeah. So you lose energy in your heart. You stop trusting yourself. You stop trusting in your future. Same thing in the brain. Brain's incoherent. You have those waves interfering. There's less energy in the brain because when they interfere, they create a flat line. Yeah. When they're coherent, all of a sudden, the, the waves get bigger. The higher the amplitude, the more energy there is. So now we teach people how to practice creating heart coherence, not just, hey, Chris, try a little gratitude. No, I got a measure, I got a little device on you yeah. hooked up to a computer and I'm watching to see if you're doing it and you're not doing it. If you're not doing it, I'm gonna tell you you're not doing it. And that's the, that's what I was saying is you can measure all that. Oh yeah, Like yeah. you could sit here and I could be like, dude, I am so grateful right now. And you'd be like, no, you're not. And I would say, you, you think you you're are. You're scared. Yeah, you're sorry, exactly, you're really not. Wow. But I can say to you, let's turn it down, let's get, or heighten the sensors and say, Drama, you're getting closer. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to lower it a little bit more. And I get, come on, give me a little more. Come on, open your heart to life a little bit more. And you can start controlling your breathing. And when you control your breathing, you control your brain waves. Yeah. And as you start feeling safe, you move out of that survival system, and energy starts moving into the heart. Now, once the heart starts to beat coherently, it's like banging a big drum. There's a field effect. Yeah. It's like dropping a pebble in a a, a calm surface of a pool. Yeah. There's a wave effect. And when the heart starts beating coherently, it begins to produce a measurable magnetic field that's up to three meters wide. Your heart is electric. Yeah. And now it's producing a field, an energy, a frequency. And that frequency carries information. You can lay the thought of your future, of your wealth, of your health on that frequency. The frequency of suffering can't carry the thought of your wealth. It carries the thought of different yeah. thoughts of suffering. So then energy has to make it to our heart for us to begin to create. So then if a person is living in survival and an and, and addict to those emotions, yeah. living in the stress response all of the time, and the rush of adrenaline becomes their source of energy, mm -hmm. whew, then you gotta, you gotta teach that person how to break that addiction. And just like any addiction, the body's going to have cravings. Come on, just yeah. a little suffering, just a little judgment, a little anger. The yeah. body just wants to, hit, wants to feel it so it can return back to its state. So uh, That's what blows my mind. So then it takes effort, right? Yeah. If it was easy, everybody would do it. But when people free themselves from the chains of those emotions and the incoherence, yeah. 
Wow, coherent heart, coherent brain. How do you create a future? Clear intention, that's a brain function. Yeah. Elevated emotion, that's a heart function. Yeah. So now if you can produce both of those, now you have an energetic pattern. Your body's actually emitting different information, yeah. different energy. And when there's a synchronization between your brain and heart, once there's energy in the heart, guess where it goes? Straight up to the brain. Yeah. Now the, the heart is amplifying the brain. And again, remember that, that trauma that's existing in the amygdala, the research shows once the heart starts to open, it resets the baseline of trauma in the brain. So the person goes, hey, I feel so amazing. I forgive my father. Yeah. Now, he was an alcoholic, he didn't know what he was doing, but I feel so incredible. Yeah. I don't really care, I bless him, you know, I'm so happy. And when people reach this point where they feel so self-regulated that they no longer need anything outside of them to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're free because they're not going to need the drug, the computer game, the whatever it is to regulate. They just know how to do it now. Yeah. So now they're going to be more conscious in their life. And, and the key is to not have a great meditation and then get up on the freeway and flip people off and, yeah. and then you know judge your coworker. I mean, you just return back to the old self. The job is to get your brain and body right. Yeah. Get up. Keep that energy up and maintain your modified state of mind and body your entire day. And if you can, get ready. Because yeah. the synchronicities, you're going to synchronize your energy with a new future. Mm -hmm. And you're going to start seeing feedback in your environment. Yeah. And that feedback is like, hey, dude, you're on to something. Go again. Yeah. And you go again, and here comes another one. Now, here's the cool part. I say that we already know how to do this. I say you know how to do this. You couldn't be who you are today or get where you are today without knowing some of this innately. Yeah. But you trusted yourself. You trusted the process. You didn't excuse yourself because you had a head injury or excuse yourself because of your past or where you're from. You just said, I'm going to go at it again. I'm just going to hold on to that vision. And it's so much easier yeah. to forget our vision than remember it. Yeah. But if you keep reminding yourself of that vision and who you're going to become, right? It's not the wealth. It's not the health. It's not the success. It's who you become in the process, yeah, right? Yeah. So the end product of all of this is that you're more in love with life or you're more in love with yourself. And when you are, guess what you do? You give. Yeah. You go, I feel so incredible. I feel so whole. I don't need anything anymore because I'm not in lack. Yeah. Wow, imagine a world like that. Yeah. And to be clear, not to beat a dead horse, but when you, you actually show in your books measurement. This isn't like, oh, you can get your brain and your heart to sync up and trust me, there's some waves coming off of you. You have clear measurement. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very easy, the yeah. same way as measuring someone's uh, blood pressure, uh, if, if they're in sync or not. Oh, yeah. And we have, wow, I just got off a phone call just a few days ago. We have a lot of researchers, physicians, PhDs, they're saying, you have the perfect laboratory. One week, 1, 1,500 people, whatever it is, yeah. from all 63 different countries. Yeah. They're all staying at the same place. They're in the same environment, the same client. They're doing the same things. They're thinking the same yeah. way. They're feeling the same way. They're eating the same food. Mm -hmm. You got a perfect Petri dish here. Yeah. And now we have scientists. Now we're, we're doing new experiments for biomarkers, cellular metabolism, mm -hmm. another notch, another rung in the ladder. We got all this research now with all the coherence healings, all the healings that are taking place. Uh, researchers are investigating random event generators we're gonna put in the room to determine if we're actually affecting the field. I mean, you, there's no end to this. Yeah. I mean, you know, and we're only as good as the people who are able to do it, right? Because yeah. that's our measurements, right? I mean, think about like coming from like a guy stuck in a bed, visualizing little guys rebuilding his spine based off of nothing, based off of no like, I just think this feels right to now where it's come. This is insane. I oh, know, look, look, let me tell you, I said nobody's more surprised than me. I mean, we have <laughs> yeah. people with strokes. Yeah. Like a, we had a guy, who's a, he's a professor of law in, in Munich. His wife dragged him there, stroke for 10 years, really unhappy guy. Yeah. Couldn't move his arm, couldn't move his leg. At the end of that event, he was lifting his arm above his head. He's walking, walking without his wheelchair. Now he's saying to everybody, love is the answer. You know, he just opened his heart. And yeah. you know, we have people that are in a stroke, just we just did an event in Cancun. This guy was in a wheelchair for years. He got home from that event. He was walking by the time he got home. He had his daughter bring him in, in the wheelchair. His daughter and his wife, the next morning, he asked his daughter to take his wife to breakfast. Yeah. He laid in bed, his wife went to breakfast. He got up, he showered, he shaved, he put his clothes on. He walked down the street to the restaurant, 
walked in the restaurant. The wife went crazy. Yeah. Insane. A Mexican family. Cra she couldn't believe what she was seeing. To me, that's worth more than all the gold in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean you just can't, can't beat, beat that. that. No. You just can't. <laughs> Holy cow. Okay, here's the other thing I want to ask you is you also talk, and I've seen some of the testimonials and stuff like that about the quantum world and the uncertainty principle. And, you know, a lot of people talk about that stuff. In, you know, the secret was obviously a massive thing and all that stuff. And I think a lot of people are like, well, so what? You're telling me I can just sit around and wish for something and all of a sudden someone's going to knock on my door with a check and whatever. Can you clarify, once again, I know I'm giving you a big challenge to try to do all this in such a short time, but like how that actually can work more speaking to the people who aren't sick or aren't trying to heal, but are trying to attract yeah, yeah, yeah. and try to create. Okay. How, how do we wrap our heads around that? I've had some people talk about it on here before. It's always a little unclear. All right, well, let's make it really simple. Okay. Um, you're always emitting information. Mm -hmm. Everything physical is always emitting information. Mm -hmm. If you're animated with life, you're emitting, you're emitting energy and information. Mm -hmm. So what most people do is they say, I want the new house, the new car, the new relationship. I want a, a big bank account. I want my private jet. You know, they do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they visualize that. But when they visualize it, they never get in touch with how it would feel if it happened. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're hypnotized uh, in, and conditioned into feeling the emotion when it happens. Mm -hmm. So they may do a little, a little meditation or a little whatever, and they open their eyes and their senses say it's not there. Yep. So what do they do? They experience more lack, yep. more separation. So when you're feeling lack and separation, you try harder. Yep. And now they try matter to matter to try to produce the outcome because they're feeling separate from their future. Yep. So then thoughts are the electrical charge in the quantum field and feelings produce a magnetic charge in the quantum field. Yep. And how you think and how you feel broadcasts electromagnetic energy that influences every single atom in your life. The thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the experience back to you. Yeah. So then if the person is living in anger, impatience, resentment, frustration, and they're holding the intention of their future, yeah. that's mind and body in opposition. There's, 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 not a, there's no vibrational match between anything in their future because they're saying, why hasn't it happened? Yeah. And they're waiting for their... Healing to begin so that they feel gratitude. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for their success to feel abundance yep. or empowerment. They're waiting uh, for their new relationship to feel love. Well, that's the old model of reality of cause and effect, Newtonian physics. Yep. Waiting for something outside to change how we feel inside. And if, if you're living in that lack and you consciously or unconsciously know that you're creating your future, you're creating more lack. And if you're reacting to the people and conditions in your life that are all known to you, then your thoughts and feelings are equal to everything that you know. You keep creating the same life. Mm -hmm. So then if you have to truly change, then close your eyes, disconnect from the environment, sit your body down and don't get up and do anything. Mm -hmm. Don't be in the program of the future, the past and relax into the present moment. Mm -hmm. And now teach your body emotionally what that future feels like before it happens. Yeah. Now, why? Well, the stronger the emotion you feel from the future you're creating, the more you're gonna pay attention to the pictures in your mind. Yeah. And you're gonna to begin to remember your future. And biologically, it's the same as remembering your past. Yeah. So then you have, to, you have to stay in the feeling of that future in order for you to be aligned to that destiny. And if you lose the feeling because of traffic or a coworker and you start feeling another emotion, you just disconnected from the energy of your future. Now you're back to the energy of your past. And if you tell me it's because of that person that caused it, yeah. I'm gonna say, oh, you're back to the unconscious program of being a victim. Yeah. You're telling me that you're allowing something or someone outside of you. Yeah to control how you feel and how you think. Yeah. And that's a program. So then it takes great consciousness. It takes great work. So when there's a vibrational match between your energy and it's synchronized with some potential in the quantum field, yeah. now you no longer have to go anywhere to get it because you're connected to the field. You're gonna begin to draw events or experience to you. Yeah. And they're gonna come in a way that you cannot predict. Because yeah. if you can predict them or anticipate them, they're nothing new. They, they have to surprise you. Yeah. That's the unknown, right? And that's, 
That's the fun part because the brain learns by mistakes and surprises. Yeah. Why not a few surprises? Yeah. And when, the, when that event lands in your lap and it comes out of nowhere, you will look back at all the betrayals, all the traumas, all the things that happened in your past, and you will not want to change one thing in your past because yeah. it brought you to that moment. And yeah. that's the moment the past no longer exists. So people are healing from their pasts in a lot of ways when they do this work. And, and the side effect of all of this is they feel so whole, so happy with themselves, yeah. they no longer want anything. Like all the things they want, they don't really want the house they, they, or the, all the, all the they're, they're happy with themselves. Yeah. You know, like, I think that's really a good place to start in life. Yeah, big time. Yeah, what percentage of people that come to your stuff would you say is uh, like healing or creating? Mm. Well, now, gosh, we have, you know, like we, uh, our events sell out really fast now. I mean, I like in 46 minutes. Jeez. I mean, it's, a, and we have a lot of people that come for, for to be healed and yeah. uh, more so now because everybody's healed, a lot of people are healing. Yeah. But we have a lot of people just like you and me that are chasing the mystical, yeah. that want to create something cool or working on a big business project or they want to be part of a community or they want to heal somebody else. I mean... Uh, you know, or they starting a foundation, you know, there's all kinds of cool people in our community. And I think more than anything, I'm so proud of our community because they're really high functioning, yeah. you know, feet on the ground type of people, one foot in the quantum world, one foot in the real world, you know, yeah. they're practical people that are having really transcendental moments. So people come, I would say now probably 50, 50. Got it. Got it. Uh, That's great. Yeah. Yeah, and but a lot of people are creating new lives, creating new jobs, creating new careers, creating, and you know, we do do so many different ways. That, well, you read Supernatural, there's so yeah. many ways we do it. Yeah, huge. Um, another thing that you wrote in, in, I forget which book it was now, but it's because this is something that I really have, like, I, I've practiced for probably the last year, but I've really sort of grown to understand it and believe it at the core of me is the importance of watching what type of content you take in. Yeah. And I have an affirmation that says I'm aware of the content that I consume and I only take in positive and uplifting messages. And I've just become not only so, like I said, like I, I practice it very seriously, but now if I end up watching something crazy, I'm like, oh, why would anyone do this? Like it feels like eating five Big Macs, yeah, you know? Yeah, and toxic, yeah. Yeah, and so whatever, I guess uh, that is something that you believe heavily because is it because watching it puts you in that? state or or why is it that it's so so there's two things that are really significant about this because when you look at a television screen and you see moving things on a television screen you activate uh what's called the orienting response in your brain and there are researchers that really are anti-television and anti-movies and they say you i cannot stop looking even I, and I'm I'm not the person that wants to look, and when yeah. it goes on, I can't stop looking because the orienting response is working, right? Yeah. But what happens is when you start staring into a television screen or a computer screen, you freeze, like that. You know, you just freeze. Mm-hmm. You just, and now when you freeze, your brain goes into trance, yeah. and when you go into trance, you change your brain waves from what's called beta brain waves, where your analytical mind exists. Yeah to alpha brain waves, the world of imagination. And what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. Yeah. So as you change your brain waves, you begin to suppress analytical facilities. And now the door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is wide open. Yeah. So you're going to be more suggestible to information. And suggestibility is your ability to accept, believe, and to surrender to information without analyzing it. So you're highly programmable in that state. So if you want to experience that, yeah. whatever you're watching. So CNN, it, as I'm falling asleep, is the worst thing well, I could possibly. news period. <laughs> yeah. News period. So yeah. we teach people. Or the second thing. This is the other thing that blows my mind. You watch a television commercial, and I don't watch television hardly at all. But when I do, I'm insulted by a television commercial that's programming the person for the very condition that they have the drug or the answer for. Yeah. So, you know, you start seeing a person with a grotesque thing that's supposed to be shingles, and they say, you know, Chris, as you age, yeah. your immune system gets weaker and weaker, and here comes Jane, black and white, 50, 60-year-old woman in a one-piece bikini, uh, one-piece bathing suit. She looks pretty good, uh-huh. and you're looking going, whew, 
she looks better than me. And, and if you've had chicken pox, did I have chicken pox? Yeah, I had chicken pox. Yeah. One in four chance of you getting shingles virus. And they put this grotesque yeah. image up. Now, here's what happens. You see that grotesque image, guess what happens? It captures all of your attention because you're alarmed by what you're seeing. And then you lean in. Yeah. And now they captured your attention. And now you're suggestible. So then in our work, we have people create movies of what they do want to experience in their life. And we put them in the trance. Yeah. And we do the exact same thing. Instead of, hey, Chris, as you age, your brain gets weaker and weaker. Hey, Chris, yeah. as you age, your brain is getting better and better and better. Well, yeah. why not? Yeah. And put a person in a trance, teach them how to move and change their brain waves with their eyes open. And all of a sudden, you put a good song in there that moves them, yeah. and they're seeing scenes of their life with their family and the things they want, and, they're, and the song is creating an elevated emotion, and we teach them how to open their heart yeah. while they're watching it. And I tell you, over time, people start saying, you know, I'm on my third movie, my third mind movie, everything yeah. else helping the other ones. I don't know. I'm going to do one to help the world now. You yeah. know? So, <laughs> so you can pro we're so programmable. Yeah. And, and when I wrote Placebo... I was so I was mad at myself for two weeks, like miffed that I was such a sucker for programming. I just was I didn't even know how programmed I was. And oh, from just what you learned writing that book. Oh my God! Oh, you know yeah, how programmed yeah. we are yeah. into limitation. Yeah. And 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 the antithesis of that is who we really are. Yeah. It's strip away the programming, and yeah, like people say, now here's what's happening. If someone says, hey, I healed myself of this health condition, then the next question is, can I heal somebody else? Yeah. And I'll start healing somebody else. Can I heal somebody else across the planet? Yeah. And, and we're having people do that now. Like, that's pretty yeah. good stuff, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. so now, so then what's next? Well, just give me the science. Give me the theory. Give me the understanding. Let me comprehend it. And give me a few shots to take the formula to the next level. Yeah. And someone's going to do it. Yeah. And once a few people do it, then it's a brush fire. That's over, yeah. Yeah. That's what I think is so fascinating about this stuff is it feels like there's this whole area of life and human ability that we just on a, on a normal mainstream level do not understand or practice, but also is gaining so much steam, you know, and, and thank God for the access to information and all that stuff that people can hear from people like you. Then at the same hand, all of the, you know, news is scarier and worse and crazier and clickbaitier than ever. And social media is made so good to just addict you. And that's a problem with young people, especially now, and suicide rates and all this stuff. It's like these two things happen simultaneously. I just, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess my question is this, and, and we'll kind of wrap it up, is like for a group of people, I would guess most of my listeners aren't familiar with your stuff or aren't super familiar what do you want people to know about all of this stuff you've found? Mm. Well, um, that we're not doomed by our genes or hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our lives. We are marvels of adaptability and change, and we already know how to do this. And the hardest part of all of this is just making a little time to do it. Yeah. Just start being, look, if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, then you are left with the memories of your past and you'll be predictable in your life. Yeah. If you're not creating anything new, that means you're believing in your past more than you're believing in your future. Yeah. Or you're more in love with your past than you are with your future. Or better said, you're making your past more real than your future. Once your future starts getting really real, because that's where all of your attention and energy is, yeah. your body's going to follow your mind right to that experience, just like it follows your mind to the coffee maker every morning, to yeah. the known. Yeah. It's going to follow your mind to the unknown. And, and people are doing that, and they're saying, oh my gosh, so you can't tell me you're too old. Yeah. At this point, I've got brain scans of our elders in their 70s and 80s that can rock it. I mean, they just know how to do it. Yeah. You can't tell me you're too sick any longer. Yeah. I have really sick people that have reversed very serious health conditions. Yeah. You can't tell me you had too, too much of a turbulent past. We have people with brutal pasts that are free and happy. You can't tell me you're too overweight, you're too underweight, you have too many food. You can't tell me any of that stuff. Yeah. You can't even tell me that you're, you never meditated before. In fact, that's good yeah. because you're not trying to do anything. You're just following the, the, you know, the information. So I want people to understand that what they hear a lot of times isn't absolutely the truth. 
that there's always a greater understanding. And when you begin to look at the quantum model of reality that says possibility exists in the quantum, yeah. then when you start shaking your mind loose a little bit and you start thinking in different ways, it should have biological effects first. Yeah. And then you should start seeing the effects in your life because every thought has a frequency. Yeah. So you stop hating your coworker, you start producing that energy, that frequency. People notice that. And so I want people to realize that, that they are powerful, yeah. that, that they can be defined by a vision of the future and begin to create experiences in their life that makes life more meaningful. And technology then, yeah, every time somebody blows somebody up or shoots someone or accomplishes some level in a game, there's a huge spray of dopamine in the brain, yeah. reward chemical. The, the, the receptor sites in the brain can't handle that much dopamine, so they close down. Yeah. It's like a like a, living with a spouse that always yells at you. Yeah, you they have to yell louder yeah. to get your attention. So receptor sites are just like that, so they become desensitized. So what happens? The pleasure centers in the brain recalibrate to a higher and higher level, which means in the absence of that stimulation, yeah. you can't find pleasure from anything. Yeah. The sunset is going to be boring. Going seeing your grandmother is not going to make a difference. You know, taking a dog for the walk or, or for a walk or playing with a dog is boring. Yeah. Why? Because you just blew up a nation. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's called adhedonia. Uh -huh. You can't get pleasure from anything because you hijacked your pleasure centers to such a high level. Yeah. Now, what, what, what about learning? Learning should be a reward in and of itself. Yeah. Well, a kid just spent an hour gaming or texting or whatever, yep. and now they have to learn something, they can't turn their brain on. How are they gonna turn it on? They're gonna get in trouble. Yep. They're gonna act out just for a little adrenaline just to wake the brain up, and then that becomes the addiction now. Yeah. And so technology is amazing, but you gotta draw the line, like technology at one point, and then living life, nature, getting out, experiencing, doing this, communing, sitting at a table, not everybody sitting at a table with a cell phone, yeah. but actually really getting it on, yeah. right? So, so I, I do, we just have to stay a little bit ahead of the curve with that, because if we don't, I mean, the millennial age is such an amazing age. I have kids, you know, that are, you know, in their late 20s and, you know, in one 30 years old, and, and he's super aware, yeah. because he's not going to fall into that illusion yeah. He wants to stay ahead of it and lead by example. And, and, and that's, what, that's what's going to change the world, yeah. is that. And that's what I wonder, is like, will the next, like the Gen Zs or, or whatever, will there be some sort of rebound to this, or does this just continue to get worse? You know, because I think things like, I mean, not to hate on it, because some of my listeners probably are into it, but like the gaming leagues and esports, and like it's becoming these multi, multi million dollar things. And so now you just have all these kids, I'm sure, in their rooms inside all day playing video games saying, no, there's a career path here yeah. for me. So and, the, yeah, so the research at, at, from London, I was reading the research that children, I think, I don't know if it's 12 or 14, somewhere in that age, mm -hmm. they have 20% less physical strength than 10 or 15 years ago yeah. and 30% less endurance because they don't move their bodies. Yeah. See, that's scary. Wow. That's weird, right? Yeah. That's yeah. really crazy. Yeah. Like, I mean, we, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen a kid in a tree lately. Have you? I used <laughs> no. to spend half my childhood in a tree. I yeah. was always in a tree. Yeah. yeah. So who knows like what kind of effects that has. So, so I think it's important. This kind of narrow focus is one type of focus. You get out in nature. You're on the top of a mountain, you're looking out and you're doing this broad focus, this open focus. It's so healthy for your brain. It's so healthy for your body. So I think we just have to manage it a little bit better. And, and kids should use technology after they finish their homework, yeah. after they finish all their chores. They'll be less interested in using it because they're not using it to distract them from all you know, the things that they need to do. They do it and now they feel good and they don't want to use it as yeah, much. Yeah. Okay, and then what would you say like, if I'm listening to this and I, I'm ordering your books on Amazon, um, but I want to know, when this thing turns off, I want to know what I can do now. Yeah. What well, again, I, first yeah. of all, this isn't something you eat in one bite. You know, you yeah, have, this yeah, is a yeah. process. And I'm trying to leave, I just want to leave people <laughs> yeah. with a like, okay, I got all this information, going to read more about it, but what do I do? This sounds so enticing. I can yeah. create my future. I can do all this stuff. Yeah. How do I stop living in the past? And Right. Well, um, we have this uh, online course called the Progressive Workshop, mm -hmm. and it's a nine-week course, but you can do it in a weekend if you want, and it's basically 
the introduction. You also get another course called the intensive, which is a, a 10 hour course. And it's got a lot of videos of me teaching the basics. Yep. And then there's meditations that you can actually do and practice. And um, we've done those for years and I don't do them anymore because I'm uh, onto other things, but that is the entrance level and there's so much content there. Where do they go for that? Uh, just uh, drjoedispenza.com, D-R-J-O-E Dispenza. We'll put that in the link. And, and, and then that's kind of an introduction and then come to a week long event. I mean, because mm -hmm. you'll, you'll, you'll see some pretty uh, amazing miracles and that's yeah. really where my interest is. I'm not interested in keynotes and yeah. conferences. I yeah. mean, that's dinner conversation. Yeah. Nobody changes. Yeah. I, wanna, I don't want to talk about history. I want to make history. I want to be with doers, you know. And you don't got to name them, but is there anyone like doing what you're doing? Oh gosh, um, God, I have a lot of great colleagues that are doing. But I mean, like with the platform and writing the books and doing the events and. Um, gosh, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I have dear friends that uh, my dear friend uh, Greg Braden is a, a great uh, empirical researcher, author. Uh, my dear friend Bruce Lipton, uh -huh. excellent epigenetics. I, I call him the father of uh, epigenetics. Yeah. He's really the guy. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people out there doing, yeah. doing the work. It's just amazing. It just seems like you're doing really cool work and you're doing it in, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to, once again, this to come off wrong, but I think a lot of times a lot of this healing type of stuff has a religious tinge yeah. to it or it has, a, you know what I mean? And I think a guy like you that doesn't, you don't, there's no arrogance to you. There's no, I can heal, I can change your life. I have this power. You don't. Uh, there's no religion. It's just really, I don't know. It's fascinating to a guy like me who isn't into all that stuff. And it just feels very just fact-based and so yeah. evidence-based. And it's just really cool. Two things about that, Chris. I think mm -hmm. first is um, the moment you start talking religion, mm -hmm. tradition, culture, even spirituality, yeah. you're going to divide an audience. Yeah. Because you're going to say a word that's going to either switch somebody off or you're going to say a word that the person doesn't even know the real meaning of, mm -hmm. and they're going to miss the real meaning of it. Yeah. So I think science is the contemporary language of mysticism. Yeah. And I think science is what it really demystifies that mystical process. Yeah. So that's point number one. Point number two, like, why not be a pragmatist? I mean, why not try it out? Like, yeah. Just try it out curiously. I mean, I try it out just because I'm curious to see if it works, and now I know it does. Yeah. So once you, once you start seeing it working, like... You wake up every morning wanting to do it because you don't want the magic to stop. I yeah. think that's healthy. So I do my best um, in making it really approachable. Mm -hmm. And I read a lot of complex scientific articles that are heavy. But if I can't explain it to my mother, what, what, what's the use of it? Right? Yeah. So you've got to break it down and make it really simple for people to wrap their minds around. But the real important point is, is doing it. Yeah. And, and be the scientist in your life. Measure the effects a view it caused, seeing, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my energy today and just see what, what, what happens. Yeah. Hey, it worked. Yeah. I don't care how small or how large it is, something different happened, do it again. Yeah. See where it leads you. Big time. So my thing is, which I didn't even mean to save it till the end end, but what I did was from reading about your mind movies and all that stuff, I have, a, I have my affirmations and goals that I listen to every day recorded um, with really cool music behind it and then I went through and made a video, almost like a video vision board of all the things that I want in life. And so every morning when I put in my, I listen to my affirmations and goals with the cool music while I'm watching and I try my best to feel mm -hmm. as if, you know, it's a guy opening a door to, and you see the hand and feel like yeah. that's, you're in it yeah. as opposed. So I just wanted to share with you. That I was like one that. of my like. I love it. Yeah, I, I wish I would have brought it. it I it's, totally love that. Because yeah. virtual is, I mean, the whole virtual world started at University of Washington with burn victims that, yeah. you know, you have a third or fourth degree burn and you're taking that, that dressing off and the sensory nerves are just so excited that it's really painful. So they put these guys in an, uh, in a, kind of a, a cool bath and they put the virtual world on. They were playing, they're having snowball fights with penguins and they were, there were, some of them were While they're freezing. taking off the band? Yeah, they didn't even know they were taking the bandage <laughs> oh, off. They were shit. freezing. They were too cold to notice. <laughs> That's incredible. So like you can, you can use that technology really great. So you create a three dimensional world. I mean, yeah. this is something that I've thought so much about and would love to talk to you about it because you create your world virtually and yeah. you can add to it and put more things into it and make it real. Yeah. So and make it real for one thing. Yeah. So you can be present. 
Yeah, and you notice it. Like you notice, I will say, not that I've mastered it, and I really want to come to an event. I mean, I want to get more into to everything you're doing, but when you, if you do it properly, when you take it off every morning, you feel, you know, you just, your house doesn't look like the one in the video, but you feel like it does. You know what I mean? Like you doesn't can matter. feel the difference. It yeah. doesn't matter. What yeah. matters the most is how you feel, because yeah. if you get up feeling the same way as you started, yeah. nothing happened. Yeah. If you feel differently, something happened because you're, you're experiencing your future yeah. now. That's yeah. the key. So cool. Okay, here's my final two questions. Number one, if you could hop in a time machine and you could go anywhere, any point in your life and tell yourself anything, what time frame would you go to and what would you say? Wow, let's see. Um, God, I really uh, would have to think about this, but uh, probably uh, I, uh, I would say that when I got up on my feet again and started to walk and, and try this all out, I probably would say to myself, don't hold back, trust yourself yeah. all the way. Don't doesn't matter what people think. Yeah. Just trust yourself, you're on to something. That's probably, it would have saved me uh, a little bit more of a straight line. Yeah, uh, probably. that's big, man. And I think that's something about your story that is so like, you can apply that to anyone's story or where they wanna be or, or successful people or whatever. The fact that you came up with this idea, sitting paralyzed in a bed, and just worked your way through it on nothing but faith that it would work, to fast forward now to, like I said, these books and uh, seminars and podcasts, and like it's that's crazy. That's so mm. cool. I mean, for any, it doesn't matter if you were a basketball player. That story is really cool. Thanks, bro. Yeah, thanks for sharing it. Um, last one. Mm -hmm. You can prescribe anything to the entire world mm. for 30 days and they have to do it. Mm. What does everyone have to do? Wow. We need a bottle of wine in two hours. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, real. listen, um, if I could prescribe anything instead of everybody just reaching for their cell phone and connecting to everything known the first thing in the morning, mm -hmm. I'd have them sit up and close their eyes and I'd have them start by opening their heart to life to, to the best of their ability and trusting in themselves and trusting in possibility. And then I'd allow them to be defined by that vision and, and I'd ask them to not get up until they feel like that person. And then when they were up to do their best to maintain that modified state mm -hmm. their entire day. And when we're in that kind of consciousness, um, I think we connect more with one another and I think community is created. And, and I think we take care of one another and we, we inform one another and we're, um, we bond with one another. And that's, the human being is a living organism. We're, we're species is a living organism. And we've got to start taking care of one another and healing one another and yeah. shining for one another so that others can shine. And, and, I, and I would love to see that for 30 days. Yeah. And I think we'd see big changes in the planet because of it. Yeah, I, especially right now. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. Joe, thank you, man. I can't thank you enough. This was incredible. Thanks, Drummer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.